Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Hashtag Leadership What's On Your Mind, a series to really inspire you on your leadership journey by telling stories. And we've had some great guests on and today we are speaking to Scotty Stewart. How are you doing, Scotty? You okay? Yes, thanks. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks for having me on. That's good. So, Scotty, we used to work together in the RAF and he's got a great story and I love speaking to Scotty about his leadership and his perspectives. We, we touch base quite often and, and he's a great guy. So, Scotty, I'm going to start the, um, the timer. We've got 20 minutes. So just start by introducing yourself and um, where you are, what you're currently doing, and then we'll go from there. Uh, hello, I'm Scott Stewart. I am a project manager for a company called Travis Works Limited, um, predominantly working on um, High Speed 2, um, where I'm responsible for uh, the installation of communication services that will support the construction of the middle 85-ish kilometres of that line. Excellent. I, previous to that, I spent um, 17 and a half years in the military, 12 of it as a um, communications technician, uh, and, the, and the last five or six years as an engineering officer after the RAF kindly paid for my engineering degree. Excellent. Uh, I was going to say, I completely forgot that you, you'd you done both sides, hadn't you, with the, yeah. The, yeah, yeah. the dark side and the dark side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll keep the military banter to a... To a, a, a minimum <laughs> so it's going to, obviously today we're talking about leadership um i usually start by asking are you aware or can you reflect on sort of where your leadership style experience like started or where it's come from tell us a little bit of a backstory um i suppose um i had a a bit of a undulating childhood um you know single parent families from my mum for a little while and then from the age of nine onwards just with my dad um, my dad was in the forestry commission so um the way he was paid was piecemeal so if it was light typically my dad was at work which meant i was on my own a lot um and the forestry commission again isn't fantastic pay so i was always thinking of um of ways to make money um so from the age of nine i used to push a lawnmower from house to house with a kind of petrol knocking on doors um i would offer to wash cars and then as I got a little bit older, I would um, deliver newspapers. And then from the age of 12 to 17, I was in kitchens of various um, hotels and B&Bs, um, either washing dishes or prepping vegetables or whatever it was. And um, it would be in the summer where I, where I live is very much a holiday destination for um, pensioners. So, you know, you'd be going in before school to do all your preparation and running straight into work after school and work until, you know, midnight. Um, sort of the kitchen out. Um, I always knew I would join the military. My stepfather was US Navy. I have a very close family friend who did 24 years in the RAF. All my older uncles, my great uncles and my grandparents were all in the Merchant Navy. So I always knew I would do something like that. Um, just in case of which one and when. And uh, Christmas shopping in December of 2000, I went into the careers office in Glasgow and picked up all the paperwork. Um, got a phone call on my 17th birthday in 2001 that I'd been offered a place and later that year um, went off to Halton um, and just before I left I was quite I was heavily involved in the youth football where I live um, you know starts off at, when you're under seven you're sort of five aside indoor and then as you get older you go outdoor and it goes up um, from sort of the eight aside and to, to the living aside when you're when you're old enough and um, one of the guys that I used to go with on a Saturday morning to help do all the kit prep and all the the tuck shop for the young lads when they finished they told me um you know if you come back here and you after failing don't let me see you because i'll kick your ass and <laughs> he said um he said you know just do as you're told without expecting any reward you know work hard without expecting any reward and, and I, I guarantee you that um you know you'll, you'll reap what you sow kind of thing um Halton was fine went off to cosford um the course at the time was that was it was tough you know exams every week fine got to spay adam in december of 2002 my first my first uh, posting out of the school and um just threw myself into everything i was playing three sports for the station uh you know i was playing football for the RAF. um threw myself into my work i got involved in the mess um doing what i could with the with, with that and Quickly got promoted to corporal in 2007, went down to RAF leaning again, threw myself into it down there. That job was on the road a lot. Um, and this had this had this kind of mid-20s crisis, I suppose, um, that I was 
wanted more. Uh, and so volunteered, uh, got to go off to RAF Cranwell to become a junior regiment officer. And this is where I realized I'd made a mistake. This is the first time in my life where I'd failed. First time in my life I'd been told I wasn't good enough to, to do that job. And I came down um, in the summer of 2011 with a bit of a bump. Um, you know, perhaps young and arrogant was right um, and needed a bit of a reset and actually made me look in the mirror and think, well, what am I actually really good at? And I was good at being a communications technician. Um, I enjoyed it. Um, I've always been quite technically minded with physics and maths and things. Um, and so I uh, kind of had to, I don't know what the word is, reorientate myself, I suppose. Um, and and really, uh, as, a, as, a, as a corporal, I was... Um, Relied, you know, relied upon perhaps more heavily than maybe the sergeants or flight sergeants to get stuff done, and that and that made me stand out for things like promotion. And so I reapplied to be an officer, but this time as an engineering officer. Um, and only when I went to the Defence Academy at Trivenham and was asked to actually think about leadership properly for the first time, because I've done JMLC, which I really enjoyed, and you've you know you've been on and probably facilitated yourself. Um, it's fine, you know, crossing the, you know, using using bits and pieces to cross the shark infested custard is fine. But actually, when you're put in a position of responsibility, and, you know, it's, it's, it's important to separate out command, leadership, and management. And command is a position of appointment that you're put in that has certain privileges in terms of authority. Um, leadership, I believe, is an in, inside you, and you can either can do it or you can't. And management is something I believe that you can be taught and shown. And, um, and so, being able actually having to dial in, dial into that properly um, at the academy is where I actually found that I'm actually a situational leader and I actually reflect on the situations that I myself have been in the past and things that I've experienced. So when I'm dealing with a difficult situation, I try and put myself well, where have I experienced this before um, and careful to separate um, empathy and sympathy. If I haven't experienced it before then I can be sympathetic to it but I can't be empathetic to it whereas if I have then I know how it feels inside in that kind of situation and how did I react last time and what was the trigger and how did I fix it you know there are certain times you've got to hold your hands up and say I can't help you with this but I know if you want I can get you know I can put you in touch with this organization or this person who I think will have you know, the better experience to deal with it. And, and so that's kind of how I've taken it forward as a more situational. I've never seen myself as particularly visionary as in, you know, charge, follow me up the hill sort of thing. Um, but I've always tried to um, be worldly wise with my reading lists and, uh, you know, the, the stuff that the, the continued professional development I do in my own time to develop that, to sort of, underpin all those situations I've been on to give me more options to deal with them as they crop up I suppose and that's also and I know that's why we've kept in contact because of our vested interest in our subjects and particularly leadership that's why we've kept in touch what you've said so far is is, is amazing there's some of that stuff I didn't realize but again we can tell by how you've story told there that that goes into one of my big things about you have to lead yourself and your leadership comes from your experiences and, and what you've been exposed to. Um, and you said it really well then. So what? tell us a little bit more about obviously now in, and in the military, um, you talked very much about self. What have your experiences been about leading others and having that kind of role of shared goal shared direction because again and again situational awareness just to pick up on that is a massive thing that i is should be promoted and, and getting yeah. people to think um, but what about others i suppose in the military you have you know you know, you know, you know as well as i do the order flowed down um and if there's a situation even if you don't believe in it yourself in order to um, get your team to do it, you have to make them believe that you believe in it as well and make them think that you believe in it as well. So sometimes it's about being honest and saying, look guys, I know this is a bad situation, but we're not getting out of it. And you'd be, and you'd be really upfront and you say, um, 
I will do everything I can to make it as easy, easy as possible for us. If anything goes wrong, I will take responsibility for it. You know, so you give them that comfort to be able to express themselves either with their own leadership and their own teams or with their own technical ability. Um, sometimes you have to be a bit of a tyrant in the military and have to say, <laughs> put up and shut up. This is, this is, this is, this is what's happening. There's nothing we can do about it. Um, I've always tried to create an environment where um, the guys feel that they can just get on with their jobs as easy as possible. And even if that means I get some stick from my peers or my superiors, I'm happy with that because I've, you know, you grow thick skin over the years. As long as my guys feel that they can trust me and um, can get on with their day jobs with minimal fuss, then I'm, then I'm happy. And, that, and, the, and where you know you're going right is that is when, you know, they come into your office and say, I want to do what you've done, you know, or I just want to thank you for that time. And even now when I've left, I'm still getting phone calls and emails from people saying I'd like some assistance, some help with, you know, this situation I'm, I'm dealing with. And, I'm, and I've, that's where I've kind of reaffirmed that I did the right thing there. Um, and how that differs to now, um, in the military, you've got this sort of safety net of no one's, unless you do something terrible, no one's going to lose their job. You may get punished for it, but you're not going to lose your job. Um, and being in the military, because you do these long contracts out to like 22 years, it's safe. You know, whereas in civilian employment, you know, for the first three months of my new job, I was on one week's notice. And, and even now I'm on three months notice, so I can be told tomorrow, in three months time you haven't got a job. And so you're always, you're always planning for that, you have a plan, you have to have a plan B. Um, and so it's, it's inherently less safe, and so I think um, it's in everyone's best interest to do the jobs that you best do your ability so you don't put yourself in that situation. Um, my boss has shown some great leadership in that he told me that he would sell during the, you know, on the lead up to the COVID, the COVID crisis, he basically said, I would sell everything out from underneath me to make sure that none of you will be made redundant because I understand that you have people who depend on your monthly income. You know, we understand that you have wives and, and children and you have your own bills to pay and your own problems and your own lives. And so, you know, I would rather, I, I, I sacrifice and I hurt financially and personally to keep this business running. And I, I thought that was brilliant. You know, he did it in writing and he did it in video calls, I thought he was that was a fantastic example of how to lead a business in in, in what is an uncertain period. Also, uh, I'm just thinking then that very much matches what you've just been saying about how you led in the in the military as well. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's a and and again a lot of what you're saying as well kind of comes under that bracket that I talk about a lot about how what environments are you creating that brand and culture about what is the, the norm what are you creating around you um so what what the big thing have you changed as a leader from your military into non-military um i suppose i suppose you have to i don't i don't think because not everybody understands no one has the bar no one who has never served in the military has a bar to measure anything against so there's the thing that everybody who's served regardless of service or rank is you know the shared experience of basic training trade training overseas operations away from your family for a long time um you know they, they have no bar to measure that against and so they don't see it from your perspective so often i just feel like i don't mention it unless i know it's going to benefit me in some way so you know if i'm talking to um for example, one of the sites we're dealing with is an MOD site. And so as soon as you mention an XMOD, they go, oh, you know, okay, brilliant. And that, instantly that relationship changes, instant trust. Um, but no, I, I, feel like I, don't, I feel like I just don't, I don't really mention it if I don't have to now. But my, in terms of leadership, um, I think we spoke about it before. It's very much from first contact, building up that professional rapport that you hope can turn into personal rapport and friendship. Um, and not because you want to be manip manipulative later and try and get favours and things out of them. I just think it makes the whole process easier and it kind of greases the wheels of getting things done. Um, you know, if people, if you, when you do that, you hand in hand with that rapport, you develop trust. And so when you say, I'm going to do something, obviously you have to back that up and do it. But then you feel like if they say, oh, I'll make sure I do that for you, you can almost kind of park it because you know it will get done. Yeah. And so that, that relationship management, I suppose is one facet of leadership um, 
that have that has, has changed for me because in the military it's just there, whereas you have to develop it more now in the civilian setting, I suppose. Yeah, do you know what, that's just, you've just reminded me about something that I kind of talk about when people ask about the military, I talk a lot about that shared experience. And people don't realise that what you, you can get parachuted into lots of different teams, can't you, in your time oh, in the military? Yeah. And the fact that the basic training, and obviously what I was getting involved in, in adventure training, whoever you get put with has done a form of basic training and they've done a form of adventure training. So you've already got shared experiences that you can have a laugh about, have banter about, yeah. and you're already on that no like, and trust. So suppose that's what's different in, in the corporate world. Some businesses and, have got and, processes. And the reason I had massive imposter syndrome in 2019 when I was working in software engineering is because I had no shared experience. I couldn't do what they were doing. Yeah. I had to learn. And learning from a position of leadership. So you're up here, you know, running a team of people down here who are way better at you than what they, at what they do. Um, and I felt that I just couldn't exist happily in that environment because I couldn't because I couldn't do what they could do. I felt uncomfortable about it. I didn't have that shared experience. Yeah. Um, Whereas no, I'm, I'm just, I know, like a fish in water. It's just my I'm happy, and I can yeah. I can talk I can talk the tech with the with the, with the engineers that are doing the thing, but I can also do the you know manage the project and deal with the people and the stakeholder management and the expectation management and relationship management over here as well. So I'm much happier. But like you say, if you haven't got if you haven't got anything to compare it to, that, that was that was way out of my comfort zone. Yeah, I was going to ask you about when has leadership been challenging for you, and oh, that's definitely. a great example, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, people-wise, it was fine. You know, I can talk, I can make friends in a phone box. I'm happy with making, you know, with talking to people about things, and and you can start small talk about family and kids and you know football teams and whatever else really really easily. But when it comes when it boiled down to it, and they said, you know, they would I would be bypassed because I couldn't help with the problem. If they had a problem that was to do with the software, I couldn't help with that. They would go to one of my peers who was software orientated and do that, um, and yeah, it's it's tough, really tough. And, and I felt not not inadequate. I don't think that's the word. I just felt like um, I felt like it would take me too long to catch up, and too much of my time to catch up, where I wouldn't be then an effective um, manager in, in that environment. Yeah, because because that's an interesting point as well, isn't it? That that's an interesting question when you say as a leader do you have to know all the answers? And, I, and again, that's, I know that's not where you're coming from, mm. but again, that leadership role of, of having people in the team who are the, because I've dealt with business owners who, who don't know everything about their business, but they've got the right people in the right places to make sure that comes up through the team mm. to make sure that they're the leader at the top, making sure they're, they, they have got the right people, but they're making the decisions and they can look at the bigger strategic thing. But I, I totally get that. And again, it's this situation, isn't it? Everybody's, every business, every person. And I can tell by your story why that would be a bit uncomfortable for you because you want to be part of the team just as much as being the leader. Yeah, I want you want to have influence and you want to, like the, the current project, the current project I'm in now, I really want it to succeed. And so, you know, if there's anything I can do to help out, technically with that project then then i then i i'll throw myself into it and equally um the wider business the company look trust works you know we've got people across multiple business units i say to them all you know if there's anything you think i can help you with then then just come and talk to me because i want to see the business succeed um so you want to have that influence and also it's about this belonging and um again when you're in uniform and you're in the military you you, you have that belonging you know because of that shared experience but also i'm trying to you know I would like to, I want to be part of, I want to be part of the success of the business and the project. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Good. So we've only got a minute and a half left. I told you 20 minutes. Thanks, quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if somebody, obviously people listening to this and watching this are on their leadership journey, um, what sort of advice would you give to somebody? Just a couple of nuggets of information about what you would say to somebody who wanted to supercharge their leadership journey to do something to to get out of that kind of i've not done anything for ages i need to push myself further on what would you suggest what have you done uh I, i'm a bookworm i read and it doesn't have to be a, a, a real lot of non i read a lot of non-fiction um you know biographies of people who have gone through you know um 
who've gone through tough times. Most, you know, given my background, it's mostly military, ex-military commanders. But um, yeah, checking out things like you know Simon Sinek and um, and I read a lot of uh, I can't pronounce the name properly. The uh, Sapiens and um, 20, 21 Problems for the Twenty First Century. I can't think. I can't remember the author's name at the moment. But just for me, it's been expanding my my horizons with with the books, expanding knowledge with the books that give you those little tidbits of information, those little those little tools that you can then use to underpin um, your leadership and, and management style. Um, awesome. Read Good, I, just read. Uh, I was going to ask you what you get. Yeah, that, that's awesome. I'm going to stop the clock now because a couple of times it's taken me five seconds to stop it buzzing yeah. away at me. So, um, Scotty, thank you so much for your time today. Um, thank you so much for sharing your, your story. I hope you enjoyed that. Yeah. And um, so, Anybody who's watching or anybody who's listening, please make sure you hit subscribe, follow, um, like, leave us a review. Please pass it forward and share it with others. Um, we These come out every Wednesday at six o'clock in the morning for the early birds. So um, we'll be coming back on next week. So, Scotty, thank you so much again. Thanks, Stuart. No worries. See you next week, everybody. Bye. Bye.